Members of the press hall set. Would everybody please rise? Good evening and welcome to the June 2016 Town of Fairfield Board of Finance meeting. I'm going to ask uh, our two registrar of voters to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Please, gentlemen, go right ahead. It's actually the first time I've ever heard a countdown to the pledge. <laughs> it's like you were going to whip out the guitars. Okay. Um, tonight we have a few things on our agenda. Seven items, really. Uh, approval of the minutes for the last several meetings. I'm actually going to ask for a delayed action on that. Um, the second item is to hear, consider, and approve the transfer of $98,000 from the contingency account to the fire department's maintenance and repair of automotive account for some emergency repairs. Third item is to approve the transfer of $37,000 from the contingency account to the registrar of voters uh, for costs associated with the presidential primary. Fourth item is to review and discuss a proposed ordinance amending the town employee's retirement plan. We actually have no standing on this item, but the RTM has been asked to consider it and they ask that we take a look at it or at least be aware of it uh, prior to their acting on it. The fifth item is to review and discuss the 2015 or 2017 fiscal year budget. That is really an update from a prior meeting on um, savings this year that might be able to be applied to some differentials from last year in funding or next year in funding. The seventh item is uh, a holdover item from the last meeting, and that's the uh, to discuss the establishment of a board of finance building committee uh, to review. Uh, building committee processes and reporting. And the seventh item is to discuss the fund balance committee and the budget committee. Uh, questions, comments, concerns from board members before I go any further? Are the minutes being delayed or being pushed off to the next meeting? I'd ask them, I would ask that we push them off to the next meeting. Yeah, they're all screwed up. Right. I mean, it's not, right. a, not a very good effort. Um, so we need to like work through that and, you know, some basic things that were on there are just not right. That was my read as well. So let me go right to it if I have no other questions or comments. Uh, item one on the agenda was to hear, consider, and approve the minutes of the May 5th, 2016 regular meeting, the May 17th, 2016 quarterly review meeting, and the May 26th, uh, 2016 special meeting. Can I have someone put that before us, Mr. Brown? Second in by Mr. Becker. Okay, this item is now before us. Um, I would like to propose that we delay this item for the next meeting for the express reason that in going through the minutes I found a lot of questions, comments, concerns that I had. And based on what Mr. Walsh just said, he has similar. I don't know if other members have had the opportunity to review them and we have several members absent tonight for a variety of different reasons. What I would like to propose is that uh, anybody on this board please go through these three minutes in the next week or so, uh, provide comments, questions, concerns in writing to myself and the clerk of the board, and we will try to get those cleaned up in the minutes of this meeting before we vote on it or put it, put it before us. Um, anybody have anything on this? Seeing none, I'm going to make a motion that we delay, uh, just as I just said, we delay voting on these items until our next regularly scheduled meeting. And then in the interim, any comments on these minutes, any corrections uh, be forwarded to the clerk and myself in writing so that they can be reflected in the minutes. They'll be redistributed and we can discuss them at the next meeting. Do I have a second to my motion? Mr. Becker? All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Item number one is done. Thank you, everybody. And let me be clear, although we have some um, differences on these minutes, um, we're very appreciative of the work that the, the group and the secretaries do on our minutes. They, by and large, do an excellent job, and we very rarely, if ever, have issue with our minutes. So please let the record note that there was, um, this is the anomaly and not the rule as it relates to uh, the preparation and the minutes of this group. So thank you very much for the efforts. Um, we're going to go to item number two, which is here, consider and approve the transfer of 98000 $387.10 from the contingency account to the fire department's maintenance and repair of automotive account 
for emergency repairs to engine number 5 LSN 11. Uh, do I have a motion to put this before us? Mr. Brown, second in. Mr. Hopkins, all in favor? Oh, sorry, the item is now before us. Um, please, whoever is speaking to it, come on up. I know we have representatives of the fire department. Mr. Mayor, you can speak to this as well. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. How are you? Good. In September of 2015, our mechanics were doing routine maintenance and noticed uh, that there was, uh, they found a large amount of corrosion on the frame rails of uh, engine five. It's a 2004 fire engine. And uh, it was in a particularly bad area because it was where the frame rails and the, and the suspension meet. Uh, it was sort of a hidden area and uh, I, I do have a picture of it up there so you can see it's, it's pretty extensive. So we brought in the, uh, the manufacturer, Pierce Fire Engines, and they uh, examined it and they uh, were very concerned. They said that we could not use this fire engine as is. Um, the, the frame rail was, you know, when it, when it was first like this, now it was way beyond the tolerable, you know, uh, amount uh, of material left. So we had to take the, the apparatus out of service. So we're, we're asking for these funds to be, um, uh, to be uh, put into our contingency, uh, from contingency fund into our uh, apparatus maintenance fund uh, so that the, the apparatus can be fixed by the manufacturer. The, uh, the proprietary system, it can't be done, we checked, it can't be done by anyone else. So uh, that's okay. where we are. Do we have questions from board members on this item? We'll go to Mr. Hopkins first, and then we'll go to Mr. Walsh. Good evening. Good evening. How, uh, how much longer will this vehicle normally have been in service? Well, we, uh, we can really give it, uh, this is tw a 12-year-old fire engine. We've, we've been keeping fire engines for 20 years, for 25 years. Uh, so uh, we will have it in first-line service, and then we usually put it into a reserve service and still get a lot of good out of it. Fire engine, we think, is uh, too good to waste. And uh, we believe when this comes back, it will give us great service to probably 25 years at least. And you've had this out of service for now for how long? It's been out of service since uh, September of in the fall. And how are you covering? We're just using one of our reserve pieces um, right now. So, but it's it's an old piece, uh, you know, uh, an old fire engine. So we, you know, it's one of our spares. So. Okay. All right. And so, all right. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, based on these problems and these new chemicals that are being used, is the manufacturer changing their manufacturing process in the future to change uh, how, how so this doesn't continue to happen on, on materials? Well, it's not just fire engine, fire trucks. It's, it's all over uh, the, the trucking industry. They've all seen it. They're doing new coatings. They're experimenting with different things. Uh, we're not sure. This, there's been talk in the industry that maybe it's some, some standard steel that's coming from other countries, or um, you know, that uh, is not standing up to these road salts. But we, we think the biggest thing that we find is that uh, they've gone from years ago. They used to use salt and sand, and now they're mm -hmm. using this brine, which is very, very corrosive. It, uh, you know, it's a better for melting. It's, it's less expensive for them. So, um, uh, so everybody's trying to figure out what's the best way. So at least for us, we're in doing more inspections. We're washing the underside of our fire engines more often. Uh, with new fire engines, we're, uh, we're specking out one right now. We're looking to get um, better coating, uh, and the manufacturer's talking to us about that. You know, so uh, hopefully these things all combined will give us better service. How many manufacturers are out there of fire engines? You know, there's not that many. I mean, there may be, there may be 20, you know, uh, give and take, but then there's many that just can't build the type of fire engine we need. But it just seems like this is across the board from what we've seen. From all manufacturers? All manufacturers are having issues like this. And all tr trucking companies, too. You know, all truck manufacturers. All right. Um, I see the first select here. Mike, can you come up for a second? Has the town looked at how this is affecting every taxpayer's car? Because if this is happening on with our fire truck, which seems to be in the picture pretty heavy duty steel, I mean, I'm like questioning whether, I know it seems to be a quicker cleanup process, 
for the town roads, which saves the town money in DPW costs. But if it's costing everybody's car to be deteriorate faster, it, I guess the question starts looking at, is, are municipalities looking at this to see how quickly it's causing damage to, you know, the 10 or 15 or 20,000 cars that we have in town? I think there are several components to this. One, realize that when the DPW is clearing the roads of ice and snow, mm -hmm. that's a public safety concern up mm -hmm. front because if anybody slips and slides, if, if there's a car accident, if somebody's injured or perchance killed, that becomes a much larger issue at every level. I think that uh, in talking with DPW, first of all, we had DPW and fire talking uh, and police to kind of look at what were taking place there. I think that uh, as this uh, deputy chief mentioned, uh, washing the undercarriage on a more frequent basis is one of the maintenance things that's being installed. To your larger question, uh, in my talks with DPW, I believe we're using a, um, or have reduced the, I'm going to call it the concentration, I'm not quite sure the right term okay. there, so forgive me if I'm a little bit off. Uh, much less so than say the state or the towns in Massachusetts use, because we've been, it, it has been a discussion on a wider range in terms of what you can do for, right, for mm -hmm. public safety, but also minimize the costs, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. for not only public vehicles, but private vehicles. So it's been talked about, we're looking about it. If the question is, is there an answer in the wings, at the moment, no, there's not. Okay. Mr. Tetro, just to jump in on this, and thank you for the explanation, could we ask that um, whoever the appropriate people are in DPW come before us at the next quarterly and just discuss kind of, you know, what's going on in this area, what the impact is on their budget, how they're using it, just so that we get a better understanding? Yeah, and my, my caution is it's both budget and effectiveness. I understand. The, we know that that, yeah. but, but we're going to talk about it. I want to know if they're doing it basically to save cost, or is it effectiveness? To your point, can they lower the concentration? Can they do a mix? What is being done? Because I think Mr. Walsh is right. We've got something like 40,000 vehicles on the on the town roads on a daily according basis. Actual or according to DMV? Right, exactly. <laughs> Who knows? We'll get that answer as soon as we know what the governor does with the budget. Yeah, well. That would be fine. I um, believe uh, Mr. Bartlett's addressed this before the board in part in the past, so getting an update on that would be, seem entirely reasonable. Yeah. yeah, and just whether there's any studies at the state level on this Issue. Exactly. Or multiple state. I mean, it's More not it's not a state. it's not a Fairfield issue or a Connecticut issue. Yeah. This really is a Northeast issue, I guess. Right. And it, and if it is something about the budget, and you know, if he if he comes before us and says the effect of this is different here or, or, or what have you, we should just all know that. So when we evaluate the budget process, we've got a better understanding because obviously, this is costing us a hundred thousand dollars that we didn't think. And to Mr. Walsh's point. It's costing, it could be costing the taxpayers a heck of a lot of money that doesn't go to the government, but is coming in the form of having to replace their vehicles or, or whatever. Well, I'm also concerned about the other trucks we have. Right. I mean, why is this only happening to one truck and not all of our trucks? Why aren't we are seeing the same exact, for that aged truck, why aren't we seeing all the trucks being hit with the same problem? Uh, Do we have an answer for that or no? I, I can assure you I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're not totally sure ourselves, but it is in a hidden area. It might be just um, particularly to this manufacturer, but maybe it's, it's only on one side. Why isn't it on the other? We don't really know. And uh, it, it, maybe there was a defector, a nick, you know, maybe at some time when somebody was working on the fire engine or the, when it was made or, you know, when it was sitting in the yard before, before they fabricated it. So it, it's very hard to say. Also, in answer to your um, about a study, uh, we have a letter here from Joe Michelangelo to the fire department, mm -hmm. and he, he, he uh, talks about a pertinent paper that was released uh, specific to Connecticut. So he's aware of the problem. He's, he's looking at it because primarily for his fleet also, not, not just um, for the road, uh, you know, the road brine f formula that he would use. Is the manufacturer taking any responsibility for this at all? Like no. Splitting the difference? No, they said, no. So then why aren't there, well, what's their explanation of why it happened to one truck and not truck? Well, they, not, they not just the say it's truck. beyond warranty anyway, if, if the, right. there really isn't any warranty still. Okay. Um, all right. Questions from this side? I'm sorry. Mr. Becker, go right ahead. Just on, on the warranty, how long was the frame itself warrantied for then? Something like I, that. I think right? it was, it was warranty, warrantied against defects, not corrosion. So there was really never any uh, anything. It would just be like your own okay. car. Gotcha. So 
And there's no way to go back and, and try to figure out that this is a defect or no. something to that effect, right? To no, it's just too extensive at this point. Did this cause, I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, go right ahead. I was going to ask you, did this cause you to go back and review the rest of the fleet, make sure that- We absolutely did. And, and we're, uh, they've been taking a lot of attention to it. They've been bringing in all the fire engines. When they do see rust, they've been uh, taking them apart and wire brushing them down and repainting them. So they've been giving a lot of attention to this, our mechanics. Okay. That was my question. Oh, okay. And if I might suggest, when uh, DPW comes before on a quarterly review, it, it might also be good to take a look at, um, say, the last 10 years, uh, one of the questions might be how the mix has changed. Yep. Because what we're using today may not be what we're using 10 years ago, and part of that might have changed to accommodate uh, or to mitigate some of that damage that we're talking about. Agreed. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on this item? Mr. Becker? Just... Uh, on the amount before we do the voting, it mentions a 10% contingency. Is this in part out of your budget then, or like are you comfortable with the 98 figure? It says, I see two numbers. I see 94, then I see it talks about 10% contingency, and then 98 is the total, and then it talks about doing bumper adjustments. Uh, that's all together in all there. We wanted to put a little in there because we figured once they took everything apart, if something falls apart in their hands, that, uh, you know, since they're taking everything off mm -hmm. these frame rails, putting new ra frame rails, things might fall apart, you know, during that process, which we need to be replaced. You know, it's ten percent of recent. Ten percent of ninety-four believe it, we believe is it ninety-eight though? Uh, so is that enough? Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, great we, if it we, is, and we yeah, don't have to give you we, more. We but do hope that the ninety-eight is. That you're comfortable, just so you yeah. don't come back. We're hitting your end and all that yes. fun stuff. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Then I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mayor. Can you step us through what's left in contingency? What does the contingency account look like right now? Um, assuming you pass this uh, and the next uh, agenda item, um, I think they're somewhere between 200 and 250,000. I think cause I'm not, I'm not, it's, there's 250, but I'm not sure if that includes the uh, registrars. So it's either 213 or 250. Okay, and the um, and that doesn't count. How does that factor into the overage, this, the to surplus you were talking to us last month about? Um, jumping forward a little bit on the agenda, yeah, the the uh, the quarter review had uh, a savings of about five hundred thousand dollars from operations, two fifty from contingency, and then we have adequate uh, favorable variances in the revenue side to take care of the fund balance. So it's like 500 plus 250 plus 650 would be one million four. Okay, and that doesn't include, and then there's the fund balance surplus of six hundred thousand dollars, which is seven. No, that that includes that, no. assuming that it's cut because it'll be covered by the revenue variance. Okay, okay, got it, Mr. Becker. So going, so the 250 number that you're using is after today's two items. Uh, yes, sir. So then it's that's that's my belief. I think yeah. Okay. Definitely after this one. I think after the uh, and then that one's smaller, one. but okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was about to call this for a vote, but I don't have a quorum without Mr. Walsh here. So keep talking. Explain to us more, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, about <laughs> where we're going to get a preview of the filibuster. Please. Filibuster. Hey, I can uh, let you guys know what a pleasure it is to, to work with you guys uh, on this basement. Um, one comment. That yeah. Just going forward, since we're talking about uh, variances, the uh, chair of the finance, uh, uh, board of finance, uh, mentioned last meeting a concept to pre-purchase yep. items. Uh, I, I sp expended the, uh, the payable variance going to save next year's budget, and we actually have uh, have looked at that very closely. We actually have a way to do that with a with a degree of certainty, as Great. opposed to having to guess what our variance might be, we can actually move it forward until September. The decision making process Great. until September. Thank you. And we have that as item number uh, four on our agenda. Rather, my apologies, item, item five. number five on our agenda. Okay. So I'm going to call this item for a vote. Any, before I do, any questions, comments, concerns from the public on this item? 
Seeing none, uh, the item is now before us. All in favor of a transfer of $98,387.10 from the contingency account of the town to the fire department's maintenance and repair of automated motive account for emergency repairs to engine 5 LSN 11. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. And good luck getting the truck repaired. Thank you. All right, item number three, to hear, consider, and approve the transfer of $37,232.97 from the contingency account to the Office of the Registrar of Voters for costs associated with the April 26, 2016 presidential preference primary. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Mr. Mayor, please help partake in the conversation. Go right ahead, guys. You want a presentation or you want a presentation too? No. <laughs> okay. This Reason is where I bring out the guitar. Exactly. Yeah. Reason we're here. Roger, you may want to use the mic. Oh. Reason we're here uh, during the primary, we didn't budget for that. Uh, normally, we don't budget for the primaries, figuring we don't know if we're going to have one, two, or whatever, and to just have the money floating around in our budget. Seems better to uh, stick it off in contingency and what have you. So that's why we're here now. We're uh, asking that uh, total of 37 to 32 and 97 cents be transferred from contingency to fill our accounts that we used. It's basically the seasonal, which is our poll workers, uh, printing, uh, fees and professional services, which is our uh, programming of the scanner, uh, the voting machine scanner cards, memory cards, and there was some other, oh, overtime for the uh, secretary downstairs in terms of her uh, use of time prepping for the uh, primary. Is the cost in line with what other presidential primaries have cost the town? It's, it's in line with the cost of any election event basically cost us now. I mean, sorry, if, I don't understand what you said. If you look, we use the same amount of personnel. Uh, the only variables are the, uh, the printing because it's in terms of a pr uh, primary, normally we do like 25% of the uh, total uh, voters. Oh, I see. So we went up to uh, I think we went up to, at least on my side, we went up to like 60% because we heard that he was uh, one of the candidates or several of the candidates were going to be in Connecticut and we didn't want, what drives this is the time Obama came to Bridgeport like a day before the, uh, the election or whatever and they didn't have enough ballots. So that's why we do what we do now. So you forecast 60%, where did it come in? Uh, 43 Okay, so a little bit of high on your side. How about yourself? Um, I, I, oh, that's loud. Uh, I will generally say 20% above uh, historical um, ballot counts to say, okay, well, what did we have in 2008? So what and, did you have and what did you come in? Um, I ordered 55% uh, and uh, it was very close in most of the districts. Um, we also... Um, you know, we, uh, we distribute the ballots in sort of sealed packages. So you might be over in one district and under in another, uh, but you have a problem because you can't be under in any of them. Uh, so um, some spoilage is going to be normal. Yeah, no, I understand. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, did you find any anomalies in the costs associated with this primary as compared to prior primary? No, and, and actually I, I want to, uh, just because of history, to say this, there's the... Uh, commend the registrars for working very cooperatively together to put these numbers together to make sure we have the right, the right amounts. Thank you. And we did put this into contingency previously, correct? It was one of the items that was discussed. It wasn't put in as a specific dollar amount. Right. Okay. Mr. Walsh, did you have something I said? So we never budget for any primary in any election? In the past, we used to. Uh, and then sometimes depending on, like, like right now, uh, today we had petitions come in for the U.S. Senate candidate on the Republican side. 
we may have, uh, based on the number of petitions, signatures that are okay or whatever, we may have another primary in August for that. Uh, you don't you don't know, and you don't know how to sort of budget at that point what what it's going to be. Uh, if we do have one, it'll be like one of those 25% ones where I... Yeah, and in fairness to yourselves, I think, and Mr. Walsh might have been prior to your time on the board, but I think Mr. Mayor, Mr. Tetra, and you, the three of us may have been on this board. There was at some point in the past where we did take it out of the registrar's office, throw it into the town's contingency account for exactly some of the reasons that you're talking about. So I think it was something that actually the town bodies did because I think previously they did actually budget in the registrar's office years ago, yeah. as I recall. You? I, th I think you're correct, and I think there's another difference in this, and that to budget for a presidential primary, think about when that number would be put, that would be 18 months ago. Right. Almost. Whereas when we're talking about primaries for the more local elections, you're talking about budgeting something in the spring, anticipating a primary in August. Right. So there's a much better time, and especially if it's local, we all may have some inside knowledge as to the likelihood of a primary or not, so it makes it easier on the registrars. In, that in this case, the budget 18 months ahead of time is virtually impossible. So when we calculate our contingency, there's money in there for these primaries? No, Specifically? It's, no. Okay. It's part of the normal contingency of, like any other... We know it's a possibility, but we don't say there's 40 grand in here for right. it. Is what you're now, if, if it were the, as I said, if, if, if it was anticipated in August and it was something on the local front that we could anticipate because we knew there'd be enough interest in one of the slots that we might be doing that, then that might be budgeted by the registrar at that point, but in our budget. <coughs> well, okay. It just seems like a year ago when we were doing the budgeting, we had 18 candidates on one party's side. I think the likelihood was probably high that we were going to have a primary. That would have been a good time to speak up. Okay, no, I just, I think we got to look at it, I guess, every year, and so we can speak up. Um, I just didn't right. really know what the process was, so. Well, the reality is, though, it is covered in the contingency. I mean, we Yeah, do I mean, that's why we have stuff. a contingency, right. and not everything in the contingency is spoken for for just this reason. Right. And obviously, Mr. Walsh, I didn't mean to... to to say it quite that way, because it, it, it's hard to tell how many of those guys would stay in, stay out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, nobody, it, it, to my knowledge, nobody at this level has that inside knowledge as to what's happening at the, the national level. Um, right. And certainly, uh, on one side, it started with, you know, two, I guess, and they stayed in. Who thought that was going to happen? Still two today. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, could be a little, little hard to predict, but... I think that's one of the reasons for anticipating some need for contingency at some level mm -hmm. so that we can account for different things, everything from the corrosion factor to uh, this type of incident. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from board members on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to the public. Seeing none from the public, I'm going to call for a vote on approving the transfer of $37,232.97 from the contingency account to the Office of the Registrar of Voters for costs associated with the April 26, 2016 presidential preference primary. I, uh, I am going to recuse myself from this because I actually worked uh, during this primary, so I don't think it's appropriate that I, I vote on this item. You're, you're part of that deficit. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm passing on this is I, I was asked to vote on it. Yes. All in favor of this we transfer? We don't have a quorum then. We don't have a quorum. Oh, that's right. So we can push this to the next well, meeting. Well, no, I can abstain, and you guys can vote. I'm just going to abstain. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? I abstained. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I thought of that earlier, actually. Uh, <laughs> to review and discuss a proposed ordinance amending the town's employee retirement plan. Now, let me talk to you about this item. Uh, this came to me through Mr. Mayor and through the moderator of the RTM. Uh, this board does not have any standing on this item. Um, this is not a voting item. This is a discussion item at the request of the RTM. Mr. Mayor, you can provide some insights and kind of step us through this. And, and lead the discussion. Mr. Tetro, as you serve on the, the pension board as well, um, you can free to talk about this, but go right ahead. 
Thank you, sir. Um, there is an inconsistency uh, between the town, as everybody knows, for the purpose of people who might be listening at home and may not know, the town has two pension plans. It has a pension plan for public safety, police and fire, and a separate pension plan for uh, the, all the other uh, town employees. The, there's one inconsistency, one major inconsistency between the two plans, and that is um, what this addresses. Uh, the, on, on the board of, on, excuse me, on the police and fire pension plan, uh, or in that plan document, when a person retires, that person can come back to the town, uh, work part-time, uh, and if they're not collecting any benefits, and if they work no more than 988 hours, they can work for the town in any job that was not a job that they retired from um, without having to give up their pension. That uh, is not available to people who work on the town side. This is an issue that comes up now and then. It's just recently, uh, because a couple of things that came up recently have moved to the top of my priority list to bring this before the pension board and then to the town bodies. Um, examples for ex are uh, Chief Peck. When Chief Peck uh, retired from, uh, from the police department, uh, he went to work over at the senior center for a while. All right? uh, he was allowed to do that because the pension plan allows, like I said, uh, people who retire from the police and fire uh, unions to and uh, from that pension plan to work. Um, an example on the town side would be, um, and one of the ones that's coming up, uh, Chief McNamara's uh, secretary is retiring. Chief McNamara's secretary is not, uh, even though she works for the police department, she's not in the police and fire, she's not a, a safety officer, so she's in THEA, which is covered by the uh, town pension plan. She's also a special uh, po police, member of the special police force. So she would have, without this particular uh, recommendation being passed, she would not be able to continue as a special officer. Um, other example is some of the people who uh, take minutes for town uh, okay, meeting, can meetings. Okay, can I stop you for a second? What does that mean she would not be able to continue as a special officer? Is that because she would have to give up her pension benefits if she continued working in the other role? Correct. But in the other role, is she accruing any pension benefits or any no, other no, no, the you, you, no, there would be no accrual of any benefits or any pension. Okay, so, so just... And my so this is basically, to sure. get to the heart of this from, a, from yeah. a financial perspective, there's no cost to this. To the town. To the town. No cost to the pension plans or the town at all. It just gives people the right, uh, for example, if you're a minute taker and, and you're working, uh, as of right now, a person who's taking minutes, uh, you know, if she, when you retire, she would not be able to continue taking our minutes and collect her pension. But if this passes, she'd be able to continue taking our minutes and collect her pension. But you take work a maximum of 988 hours a, a year and, re, and receive no benefits. And we have no cost letter from uh, our actuaries to support that. And the RTM, even though they understand this is a no-cost thing, they, anything financial, anything that's potentially financial, they like to have uh, presented to the Board of Finance before it comes to them. And that's why it's here today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Questions, comments from board members on this? Well, actually, I don't agree with that last statement you made because, you know, there's town contracts that don't have to go to us and they don't get reviewed to by us either. So to be quite honest with you, you know, it's not in our purview. We shouldn't really be taught discussing it. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, good point. Mr. Brown? Currently, how many on the public safety side are taking advantage of this? He's mission chief Peck, but other than that, anybody? It's, there's, there seems to always be a couple around, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not a big number. I mean, cause a lot of them are special officers and not a lot, a few, but I, I really can't answer the question specifically. And does the town actually receive a benefit operationally from having this because these people know how the town operates? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, one, one of the other issues ones that come up is right now we have two openings uh, due to retirements in the uh, 
uh, building department, mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't uh, and we have not successfully recruited for uh, both positions. I think we do have one candidate that's going to come. To the I think we have a candidate for the electrical inspector mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to bring aboard by uh, July uh, July one, uh, but. Even if we do bring both aboard, we're not going to have time to fully train them. So we would be able to bring back one of the people retiring part time to help with the training process. Be an example of how this would benefit operations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How long have we had those retirements in? How long have we had notice of those retirements in the building department? Uh, I think sometime in May. I would hope that we can get somebody in those positions because it's kind of like the hot time in the building department when they're generating as much revenue as possible. Uh, does that look likely? I mean, to be out, out, out people in that department who can't do building inspections where we can't generate fees and things like that is going to be a problem. Yeah, we're very sensitive to the need to fill all open positions. And uh, like I said, I'm pretty, pretty sure we'll have uh, the electrical inspector, which is the most pressing need filled by July 1. Uh, I can't speak with such certainty about the, uh, just the generic building inspector. But that's, we also... It's like an urgent position. Pardon? It's a kind of an urgent position yeah. to, to, to yeah, well, fill. We also, we've, we've talked, I mean, we've, uh, there's also discussions that we don't feel that the person doesn't have to retire. They can delay retirement, that kind of stuff. So, there's, there's so they're on the job right now. So, yeah. They've given notification of retirement, but they're still working right now. Correct. And have agreed to hold yeah. over until such time as you have a we, we haven't finalized those discussions. Those discussions are being held. Okay. Mr. Becker? Yeah. So um, in the building department, I think that's great. Um, appreciative to those employees for not just sort of hitting their papers and, and being done, so that's helpful. Um, I think, um, you know, we're not, obviously not going to vote to it, um, but we are ex officio to the body that does. It is nice to hear it here, um, so I appreciate that. Um, I think the changes, are in, in my view, just, just, just before us are okay. I think it sort of gets away from or continues to keep us away from some of the big concerns that a lot of other towns have that we actually don't have with our pension. We don't have the overtime calculations. We can't just retire an employee out, let them take their pension, come back, give them a big contract, and you know, and and and, and do that. And that then can cost a fair amount. So from that perspective, I, I'm personally okay with adjusting it to do it in both. I think that that there's a benefit, and I think just you know we need to continue. Even in the implementation, to just use discretion, obviously, um, as best we can, um, it just sounds as though it's occurring. So, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I agree. Anybody else? Yeah, who made the calculation of the 988 hours? How did we get to that exact number? Is that a regular? I think it's like 19 hours times 50 weeks or something like that. I forget exactly. Who did that? And is that yeah, who It's consistent that? with the uh, what's in the police and fire retirement plan. That's why I picked that number. Do we know that that's a good number? We know that's a good number. I think Mr. Walsh's point is, can we make sure that we're not running afoul of any laws or anything like that by Yeah, checking? we have, as, uh, people can work 19.99 <coughs> hours a week, 52 weeks a year on average. So if 988 is less than uh, 52 times 19.99, then it works. 988 divided by 52 is 19 down. So, yeah. so, so, yeah, so, yeah, so 988 yeah. divided by 59 minutes a week. So, yep. Yeah, it was yeah. probably calculated out to ensure right. that they were truly a part time. We just want to make sure. Right. No. Yeah. Thank always, you. It's always good to bet. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Seeing none, I, I, just for the record, I happen to share Mr. Becker's view that if it's. Um, is not costing us anything and there's actually an operational benefit to the town of using people that are um, already familiar with these items, already familiar with the roles, uh, and financially there's no um, issue for the town. I don't have a problem with it either at this point. Anybody else? Seeing none, we've discussed that item. It's no vote on that item. Item number five, to review and discuss the 2017 uh, fiscal year budget. 
Uh, once again, this is a holdover item from prior meeting where we discussed the opportunity to use funds that are available from the 2016 budget to cover um, some of the funding deficit that may develop, and we don't know will develop, but may develop from the state cutting back on their funding to the town of Fairfield in 2017. You recall we discussed this uh, theoretically the night of our vote on the mill rate. We discussed it last meeting when Mr. Uh, Mayor indicated there was a, basically a $2 million upside uh, against budget for the current fiscal year. And we asked him to come back and report back to us on how those funds might be available uh, to help any potential gap for 2017. So Mr. Mayor, why don't you report back to us? I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. As, as everyone here remembers, I'm sure uh, this actually was a suggestion from the chair of the board um, from the idea of pre uh, pre-spending, if you will, buy a truck early, that kind of thing. Um, and there's uh, so it's an excellent idea. It's a way to make it work. We're, we're certain we're going to have a uh, positive variance uh, this year, favorable variance this year. Um, but we lo I looked at the idea and gave it some thought, and uh, we took it around and we came up with, with a, uh, a little little tweak that makes it more easy to do. Uh, for example, if, if, you're, if you're trying to estimate what your uh, positive variance is and how much you're going to spend, you're issuing POs, you got to make sure that when you take delivery, not take delivery, there's some complexity there. But anyway, so... Uh, Can we hang on just a second? I want to make sure this is an important topic. We're having some technical issues. So it's the in-house speakers that we're having. You might want to move the cell, phone, cell phones away from the microphones. Could be. Let's see if there's something else. Wow. Mr. Walsh, the tech guru here. All right. <laughs> let's let's see so, if that works. Go ahead, Mr. So Mark. so uh, so every September, this board uh, votes on transfers. Yep. All right. So uh, just discussing this with our auditors. Um, the way to uh, address this, the, the easiest way and the most expedient way to address this, is uh, we the year ends June 30. We close the books and we put together the transfer exhibits A, B, C, D, E for this board to vote on in September. What we would do at that time is um, request a transfer of all the favorable expense variances. Any revenue variances cannot be touched without going through the full town bodies, all the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, Board of, board of Ed, excuse me, board, uh, RTM. However, uh, transfers uh, only are, are, are the uh, function of this body, are the function only of this body, not the other bodies. So come September, we'll have a better handle on exactly what our favorable uh, expenditure variances are, put together a transfer, and we would transfer all of them. The line item that we picked is uh, we transfer them to the general fund debt service budget line. So say the favorable variance is a million and a half. Take all the favorable variances, zero them out, transfer them to the debt service budget line. Um, and, and then if you guys agree with that, then approved, then we do a journal entry, then transfers them out of the general fund into the debt service budget line, then in fiscal year 2017, we would pay part of our debt service out of the debt service fund instead of being paid out of the budgeted general fund debt service line. So in essence, we're transferring this year's favorable variance kind of to that special revenue fund, and then in 17, spending it out of the special revenue fund instead of out of the expense fund. And then and you can do it based upon 100% of the variances or some percentage thereof. And that way we're only affecting one line item in the 2017 year With right. versus all those other online. So, so that's right. Actually makes which was one of the issues you brought up about keeping right. track of how do you do it in forward budget. I think you and Mr. Walsh both mentioned that actually at the last meeting. Right. So we yeah. throw it all into the dead service line. Right. It reduces that line in 2017 right. by paying for it with 2016 funds, 
it keeps all the other expense lines in the 2017 budget pure. Correct. On a go forward basis. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, when we when Mr. Walsh was in the room, you were, were killing time to the vote. Uh, there's this, you know, I, I can speak with a high degree of certainty that there was to be adequate favorable variances on the revenue side to cover the $650,000, and it would be more than that, to increase our fund balance. Our fund balance. So that would take care of the fund balance piece. So the total, so that fund balance piece of 650 plus contingency plus whatever favorable variances we have on the sort of side would all be available for that. And the estimate right now is that there's a little over $1.4 million if you don't take into account the revenue side. There's yeah. $1.4 million available to cover to help cover the 2.3. Yes, yeah, since the uh, uh, quarterly review, I've looked at the numbers. The revenue side has improved. I haven't I haven't noticed any change in the uh, in the expense side. But okay. like we talked, there's always those under $10,000 numbers that could go either way. So if we turn around and then, and I apologize, guys. I don't mean to monopolize the conversation. I'm trying to drive it to a conclusion. Um, and let's feel free to jump in. This is a Free-flowing, but on the Board of Ed side, the Board of Ed on the internal service fund, what number do we think? What are we projecting our available yeah. errors? The the current uh, amount available with experienced. Okay, so this is the town side. Right. Okay. So moving to, to the Board of Ed side. So on the uh, town side, we think we have between 1.2 and 1.4 million available. As of right now, it, it, right. Okay, so right. I'm going to go with a lower number of 1.2 million. So. Then on the uh, Board of Ed side, uh, there's obviously there's there's two sources. Yep. There's there's the internal service fund piece and there's the operations piece. Which Dr. Title did tell us in the quarterly review he wasn't counting on there being much available at all from the operating side. I mean that, that from the operating side. Right. Um, in 2016. A couple of comments on that. One, uh, I haven't had a chance to really go through the numbers with. Uh, I didn't actually bring them, but if you remember the first selectman uh, added $250,000 to the budget for the other ECS grant, and uh, if you look at the percentages, if you use the same percentage ratios as they use in preparing their budget, right. there's, there's actually, there's about 100, and they actually lost 100000 instead of 150000 so there be, might be $145,000 available on, on that specific line item, but that's... Let's leave that to the side. Yeah. To the side. All right. We, uh, so we have uh, received our uh, April experience and, and revisited the internal service fund, and the current of amount available uh, is 852000 right now. Okay. So we have, let's say we have 800000 there. That gives us the two million, and we had also said in the calculation that we had done that we had more favorability on the revenue side than the, in the budget. We were conservative on the 2017 on the revenue side in several areas. We were conservative on motor vehicle because you had you had factored out that we were going to lose everything, but didn't factor in that we were going to gain some back on the on the. Um, on the issue with where the cars were registered. Then there was the collection that we didn't goose up even though the collection rate was higher, was going in higher. The collection rate actually in, in the budget is, um, I was actually surprised, I was looking at it the other day, it's 98.63. Right. So at 7.3, that's 250,000 bucks. More that we're gonna have there, right. So if you go 250,000 there, then if you recall, you took, took a tuck on the motor vehicle. You'd said we were going to lose 400000 but you were very, you, you said, and I, I'm going the, the numbers from memory, said you were going to lose 400000 because you knew you had so many cars that the state had said were registered in Fairfield that you knew weren't, right? Right. And you had factored that into the budget, but you said that's a very conservative number because I'm darn sure that there's other municipalities that have cars that are registered in Fairfield that they had in the other municipalities. Right, but I do not remember. You use the gross number, not the net. Yeah, I don't. Re I, I'm just not recalling right now. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's yeah. totally fine. I'm yeah. not asking for a hard number. But even if yeah. you do the two million plus the two fifty that you just talked about in the collection rate, 
we've covered the 2.3 million. Right? Right. Now, what we don't know is this whole thing that the governor just did the other day, well after the budget was passed and the mill rate was set. With his line item veto, we don't know, we have no information on how that impacts Fairfield at this point in time, correct? The latest information I have is one point, there, there was some, there's 1.4 coming out of the pilot and, and, and 0.5 coming out of uh, ECS. And I tried to get through a calculation today based upon ratios before tonight's meeting, but I, I just didn't get through it. Mr. Mayor, I, Mr. Tetra, did you? Have yeah, any? I don't have any definitive information uh, unless Mr. Mayor is talking about something he heard since we last spoke today. No, Sorry. No. You just ran off some numbers. Where did those come from? Uh, it's in the press. But those are those numbers specific to Fairfield, or no, are those that's numbers? The total. The, the, the total is that Fairfield numbers that you just quoted or state numbers? Wait a second, I think uh, th those numbers are not Fairfield numbers. Okay. Yeah. And, it's, and, and I, I missed a digit there or, or a decimal point. 14 million and 5 million, not 1.4 right. and 5 Cause, million. Because we had heard, <laughs> what's been reported is they're going to, that the governor's line item veto right. was reducing municipal aid across the state by something like $20 million. 20 to 20 million, yes, right. correct. And at the current time, and based on the discussion that you and I had today, mm -hmm. and that I've had with the state legislators via, legislators via email, yeah. we don't know what the impact of that is. Yeah. We have a full range of options, unfortunately. Right. There's a um, one, I'm going to call it a rumor, for lack of a better term, that the uh, General Assembly may come together and override the governor's veto, which would mean there's no $22 million cut. Other cuts would come. Right. Um, there's looking at the numbers and saying, well, if that $22 million was prorated the same way that the $100 million cut was a while back when we lost the $2.3 million, then it might be between $400,000 and $500,000 incremental hit on the town. And then there's another rumor that says um, they might, um, government might go ahead and wipe out, you know, all the ES ECS funding for, for the uh, towns uh, that he did in his version of it, in his second version of the budget. Uh, and that would be about a 1.7 million hit. So the question is, which one of those? I don't know, and I don't have any way of weighting them and saying here's the most likely or less likely uh, to take place. Right. So to put a bow around it, the original $2.3 million uh, municipal aid cut that we had to absorb we have the ability to absorb that based on best available information today. Correct. Right. With some adjustments, but yes, we can absorb it. Right. Moving forward, we don't know what impact the proposed cut, we don't even know what the proposed cut is, if anything, to Fairfield moving forward. And to your point, we don't even know whether it'll survive the state legislature. If, the veto, if, if there's a veto override, you're correct. Right. I think the other consideration as we go through this is looking at what we do now we, the, in anticipation of next year, realizing that the adjustments we make, we, ideally we'd make with the idea that they would stay around for next year also. Right. Because we've got the same issues confronting us growing to some degree. As we move forward. Right. But they're worse next year. They are. It could be. be worse. Yeah. For protection? The, the state is in worse shape. Yeah. At some point when they cut enough of our aid, there's nothing left to cut from us. At some point, they can't cut anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where it will be worse next year. We don't know if it'll, the impact on Fairfield will be doubled. The impact on the state is doubled based on current projections. So the projection is for a $2, million, $2 billion loss next year? <coughs> Actually, I think the projection right now is for $1 billion because they saw part of it this year. But I, it's pick your number, Mr. Walsh. I don't mean to speak for the state. Right. Mr. Becker, you had a comment? Yeah, thank you. So, so you said um, with some adjustments. So are we looking at doing this and then making, are you looking still internally to make some adjustments? I guess that's like to get an idea of, of what's going on kind of on the administration side right now because a lot of what we're trying to do here is to avoid you know the types of adjustments that would have 
you know, certainly on the education side and within the towns, you know, service cuts, things like that, um, or cause long-term, you know, expense like, you know, I, I don't, you know, delaying some of the equipment that next year you end up or the following year you got to spend money. So we're trying to avoid a lot of that in this. Um, so are we still going to be doing ultimately some of that, even if we hit the 2.3? We have somewhere between $2 million and $4 million in adjustments to make. So to answer your question, I can't do that fully. Think of it this way. Well, right now we're trying to create some flexibility in order to handle these because we've got to do all this in a few weeks. As much as we can sit here and say in September we'll decide certain things, on July 1st we have to have a plan going forward. So at some point we'll hear from the superintendent what adjustments he feels he can make in the Board of Ed budget and how many dollars it could freed up out of that. We've just talked about uh, using this year's surplus up to, was it 1.2, Mr. Fine? 1.2 is the number I just thought it in. So you got 1.2, potentially, uh, let me just pick a number for Board of Ed, 800,000, just because it's easy to add. That's 2 million. Uh, so somewhere between 2 million and 4 million, we may have to do. So uh, what I'm looking for is to kind of know how big the sandbox is, what adjustments we can make from surplus, what we can do here, and then we'll be sitting down with the department heads and deciding a mix between what real cuts we make, what things we can put off. Because of lack of, because of the short nature of this, this may involve uh, one of the things we have all tried not to do, which may involve kicking the can down the road on certain things. Obviously, if we get up over the 2.3, you know, then it seems to me that we're going to get into that scenario more greatly. Obviously, you get to the 4 million, then, you know, everything's on because, I mean, that's just doubling everything that we've tried to do here. There's no more else to go. I guess on, on, on my end, um, it would seem, I mean, we're talking about voting in September, but a lot of numbers that we would know sooner um, in the way the year end is going to sort of shake out. So I would just want to see that if we got closer to 2.3, I mean, it's okay to go and ask for some of the adjustments, but, but not to go too deep if we've got the ability. I mean, a lot of the work I feel like that we're trying to do with this is to avoid having in this particular year to, to go and do that because we felt that we had a lean budget that accomplished the things that we wanted to all around. Um, so I'd, you know, I don't know if, 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 I guess we'll have to maybe on our next agenda put this on again and, and I think that, but it seems like you're saying because of September, because it's a couple of months, you have to almost implement a budget that has all these reductions. Well, no, no, I, I, I mean, just want to under. Well, the bottom line is, I think the bottom line is, is we're trying to do this to, to minimize the impact on the taxpayer. Right. right. So we're going to do that. I think that at some point, putting on again doesn't serve any purpose. We're going to sit down and make the adjustments we need to make. What would, what, what you've done tonight is basically give us a target of freeing up money that we can spend without any impact on the budget next year. Because those are those $1.2 million of cuts we don't have to make. $800,000 of cuts from the Board of Ed that we don't have to make on the town right. side. So then the question is how much over that we have to go. So And, and then there's revenue upside, well, that, potentially, of the other $300,000. Well, that's what I'm that's saying. Right. We basically, 1.2, 800, 250, we're sitting right, you know, we're sitting almost on the line of the 2.3 was my point. So you mentioned doing other adjustments. Well, the other adjustments yes. might be necessary because we don't know what the governor's, the end results sure. of the governor's going to be. And prudent planning would say you, you, you plan for those adjustments until the books are reconciled. Because even though we're saying 1.2, it could be 1.3. It could, it could be 1.1, 1. 1, right, because of those $10,000. So you okay. just plan that there's other yeah. minor stuff that you need to do now until such time as you have the final number. And it, I think, and... To your point, Mr. Chair, we need to have a plan in place. I'm looking to have a plan in place on July 1st that accounts for what, what might happen. So if anything uh, else happens, it's less than that. So if we mm -hmm. end up with uh, more expenses or you know, more surplus, that's great, but we want to make sure that we can cover our bet here and make sure that we're not scrambling during the course of the year. Does that answer your question, Mr. Becker? Um, for now, probably one updates at the next meeting, perhaps. I mean, this is something we should be tracking closely, but and I know you've been. Yeah, it just not saying that's yeah. not. You know. Yeah, that's fine. We're gonna be we're gonna be in. Well, your point is that you're not gonna know until it's actually reconciled, until the year ends actually. Right. Right. Mr. Walsh, did you have something I say? Yes, and, and Mike, you said you're trying to get to by July 1st, having a complete plan in place. 
where's the Board of Ed in their meeting stand on coming up with cuts on their side that they're going to present to you so that you would have a complete plan? I think this is something that, that may be handled by the superintendent based on our last conversation. He's going to review where they are. Does the um, superintendent, I saw I, Dr. Title made a statement that he would like to, him and his team would like to make those things, but that's usurping the power of the Board of Education, which is really where that power stands uh, in regards to their budget. So as much as he might like to do that, unless the board gives him that power to do it, and I've not seen that happen a lot, they normally like to keep it amongst themselves, they should be meeting now. They should be using June to have those meetings and have those discussions. Are they doing that? Uh, I, in my last conversation with Dr. Title, he uh, identified that he was working through those issues. So I don't mean to speak for the Board of Ed or for mm -hmm. Dr. Title. Okay. Have you talked to Mr. Dwyer about this issue? Uh, he has just come back. He was out of the country. Okay. I, just I would suggest back. that and this is my own so personal thing in, that in you should have some meetings with him yeah. about it and see where he and his board stands yeah. as opposed to what Dr. Title wants to do. If I, just to finish up sure. with my comment, I did leave him messages uh, uh, in email form so that when he kind of came up for air, he could get back to me. Okay. And we agreed to talk early this week. We just didn't get a chance to do it today. All right. Great. And we have till September to make a decision on this, Bob? Is that what you said? You talked to the auditor and legally yes. we have the we right have both, to we, we have both evaluated state statute, uh, the charter, and counting rules and regulations. Okay. So and we can affect these transfers in September uh, up to the maximum amount, the full amount of any favor of the net favorable variances. Okay. So there's no urgency on this at all? Nope. Okay. In fact, we're going to have better information the longer we wait. Yeah. In terms of specific numbers, you're absolutely correct. What was important to hear, though, was some guidance as to what, given today's information, if those numbers hold, what you would be comfortable with so we can plan for that type of occurrence. And I want to, and before we leave that topic, and thank you, you know, I, I kind of led that conversation on, on that number, but I want to make sure everybody's okay on the board uh, as we sit here because we are providing, you know, we're not voting on this right now. But we are providing our thoughts and guidance. Um, what are our thoughts on that? Does anybody have anything to say? Or are I, we generally good with I, this direction? I have some concerns, and maybe Bob can address them, about the mechanism for doing this and dumping this money into the debt service, whatever account that is, where the premiums are or wherever it is. Because it appears that if we did that and we dumped the whole thing in there, does this board then lose authority in regards to how that those funds are spent or what the plan is? And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Say as a, this individual board member that I'm a strong, a, a strong supporter of the um, public works capital plan of wanting to purchase trucks. And I do not want, I want that dump truck purchased, and I'm afraid that that's going to be exposed. And Mike, you made a comment to the citizen, Jenny's, our, Jenny's here right now, the, the citizen article talking about that you might need to cut back on vehicle purchases. But I personally, as a member of this sitting board, support that pro, uh, program. During the budget, I, I was very uh, vociferous about it, about how we're in the first year of a plan and I thought it was important that we continue uh, to support that plan and not go off the track on the first year. Do, if, I, if I go along with this plan of dumping the money, this excess money, into that debt service premium account, do I as a Board of Finance member now lose control on how that's spent by the administration? I would say potentially. Potentially, you don't have control of that anyway, because we can have a full budgeted number and we can choose not to spend it. Right. You can spend up to that amount, but not can't, over that. Can't over. We can spend less. Right. But couldn't we put the money in this year for 16 to to purchase that vehicle in 16? That would be one way to ensure that it was purchased. Yes. But so you'd have to do that. Uh, you'd have to do that. Before July. Before July 1st? 
before July 1st because you'd have to do the purchase order, you'd have to get it under agreement, you'd have to do that. Right? right. Now, what's the process for purchasing that dump truck? Does it have to go out to bid or is that a state where we go to a state list and we go to there and we just pick the whatever the vendor is on the state? It goes um, out to bid. There, there's not a state list for dump trucks. I, I, I don't. Even, even, even when there's a state list, you go out to bid. You do? Yeah, because there's okay. usually more than one vendor on the state list. The state okay. list is an approved list of vendors. It's not a, it's not a uh, monopoly list. Okay. I thought that was a specific price that, if that was the state price that <coughs> we could choose that price without having to go out. Yeah, for, like for example, for I mean, it's a silly example, but we we just bought a chair, mm -hmm. and then to, for. And, <laughs> percent of the poker in the tax department, right? In the tax collection department. And and we bought it from Staples for our it's a two hundred and fifty nine dollar chair. We bought it on the state list is hundred and twenty five dollars or hundred and nineteen dollars on this you know, from Staples. So there is a state list and but we don't you don't automatically use it. Sometimes it's good to use it, sometimes it's better not to use it. But to the point, it's in that dumb Trump as I understand it right now is in the 2017 budget. Right, yeah, it, it's... So this is, what this does is it says basically here's all the underages in expense in the 2016 budget. And it says we're going to take all those underages, group them all together, post them back into debt service for 2016, and spend that money as debt service. Right? Right. Yeah. And it doesn't in any way, shape, or form, to Mr. Walsh's point, have anything to do with the dump truck for 2017. Correct. Now, what it doesn't cover is if, in the course of additional cuts or whatever that come... If there were another $2 million in cuts, we'd have to look in a lot of different places. Right. 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 So this solves the problem, quote-unquote, of the 2.3, mm -hmm. right? This is it a, solves the problem that we know for sure today. Correct. It doesn't solve what we don't know correct. yet. To wish Mr. Walsh's point, you could always spend under. And that's and that is the role of the administration in doing that. Right. The goal here is to make sure we don't spend over or spend on things that we shouldn't. Into the into that point. Mm -hmm. What would be interesting to know, and I don't know this, because it doesn't report to us, but to the earlier discussions, does Dr. Title have that same ability vis-a-vis -vis his relationship with the Board of Education to spend under but never spend over. Yes, I'm not sure. I, and I don't either, but it goes back to the other point. Less past practice in that regard. Right. Although they've done pretty well the last couple of years of returning funds, in fairness to them. And we still haven't had, we're not sure where they stand on retired teachers. That was one right. of the questions we came out of the budget process on. At, uh, right. And on both sides, we're looking at what's taking place with medical health care. The right. Board of Ed took a, a ding the last month. They've got two more months to go. Town has two more months to go. I think we were relatively good after the last month's report. Town was flat. Board of Ed lost 200. But that's what dropped the 1.5, 1.05 down to 8.85. Yeah, that could, for both, we have May and June results to get to yet. Right. Mr. Walsh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure we were all talking apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So the answer is yes, we lose control once we dump it in there. Um, well, anything, I mean, using the debt service funds as, as the example, um, anything that goes into that fund, unless you vote to move it out of that fund, uh, is used to only pay debt service. It can't be used by my office to pay anything else. So you'd so, have... So you've, you've taken control of the funds and you put it where you okay. want to put it. I, to me, that's just, you know, the, the, you know, the cleanest place to put it. Well, it doesn't solve your question. I mean, we don't but lose control because if we if we gather all this up and say throw it in the debt service, we in essence that is the control that has to be spent on debt service. Period. Correct. So but the, it doesn't. So solve the excess your amount issue. that we put in there, we right. have to move it to other places later on. Is that what you're saying? No, no. no I said we're, it would be used to, to. I don't remember offhand what our debt service is. And say it's twenty million dollars. Mm -hmm. Say we have $2 million in favorable variances. Yeah. 
So we put $2 million into the special revenue account. Yes. And then when we, next year, when we go to pay the $20 million, we pay 18 out of, and there's 20 million in the budget, we pay 18 out of the general fund, and then in general ledger, two out of the uh, special revenue fund. Okay. So, so, so the savings to the uh, town budget is $2 million. Where's the extra $2 million that was budgeted to go to debt service? Doesn't that stay in that account? It's just under budget? No, 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 we use that to pay. We only pay $18 million out of the general fund, right. and then we use that other $2 million to pay the balance of the debt service that's due. We're yeah. basically encumbering it, and then we're yeah. paying it as though it was part it's of good the word, right. Yeah. right. At the end of the year, expenses would be down $2 million, mm -hmm. and we'd be short $2 million in revenue Okay. Well, because of the state costs. Oh. Yeah. Well, in yeah, the, sure, in the from, from budget revenue, yes, exactly, exactly. Or are we going to show a negative $2 million variance in debt service because we paid $2 million out of the, out of the um, no. No. premium account? You'd actually show a positive to budget. Yeah. Positive to budget on which would spend. Well, we would show, we'd, we'd show a favorable, if this were the only event, if we lost $2 million, if the, if the state net shortfall ends up being $2 million, and we did this for $2 million, and everything else came in right on budget, at June 30, uh, fiscal year 2017, the, budget, the, the net results would show a uh, balanced budget with uh, $2 million in negative variance in uh, revenue and a $2 million favorable variance on the debt service line. And they just not out to zero. Right. But we'll, we will have spent to, to accomplish that, we will have spent all the other line items as budgeted. Yeah, you're the basically trucks, accruing the it. paving, right. library books, parks and rec, everything else would have been spent per the budget. But we will lose control once we do that of when that decision is made. That will be an administration decision. When we say lose control, I guess I'm a little bit not understanding. I mean, when the, once the budget is passed and the year starts, Kind of like, you know, Mr. Tetrell tells the department heads what they can spend and not spend. I'm not sure what control there is. Well, we were talking about the last time about spending some of that surplus now, like buying the truck for $220,000. Like buying it right now, like tomorrow. Right. right. And then this way I know the truck, was, the truck was purchased, as opposed to becoming a sacrificial lamb of... Well, you know that. Well, you, you, would know, you would know that that truck is purchased. You would know that the next truck is purchased, or the one after that, or the one after that. So the other trucks are in the budget. I think. Right. We, yeah. If we step back and look at what we're all trying to do, I think, which is mitigate the impact on the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. If we could magically say, uh, you win a lottery, you give us two million dollars, we replace the government, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have to change anything else yeah. on the expense. Yeah. What this is letting us do is, in essence, use your lottery winnings for fiscal 16. Mm -hmm and spend them in fiscal 17 yeah. so we don't have to make negative adjustments. Well, it's really, yeah, I guess. And, and I by understand basically it's really the taxpayer's money that, in a way, we overtaxed last year. Actually, I would, extra, I would... It was extra I would, tax I would, funds. I would disagree with that strongly. Okay. Uh, We're ending the tax year with $2 million extra money, when you, taxpayer when, money. But, first of all, $600,000 uh, of that was planned. Yes. Okay, so that's 1.4. Part of that 1.4, is that all on the expense side, Bob, or is there some of that on revenue? No, the, uh, as of right now, the revenue side is looking about a million over, uh, and the expense side is looking, inclu uh, including the contingency account, about 750 over. Under. Uh, under, excuse me. One million. Let's see, it's... So, and part of that right. includes the fact that we had one of the lightest winters in record, so we certainly can't mm -hmm. plan for why we do have to budget for that. Um, so if we could anticipate these costs ahead of time, we would, wouldn't have, um, yeah, we would lower the tax bill right from the start. The, this is part of running a $300 million organization. It, no, I, I understand. I mean, I, we've been extremely conservative on the revenue side. The and that's why we've been generating large surpluses for the last three to four years. Actually, if you look at the last, the breakouts, yeah. it's part of its revenue, yeah. part of its expenses, and part of it's our planned supplemental contribution to surplus. 
Yeah, I don't look at the plan because that's just that's just a budget number that we 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 chose. Right, but that's that's part of what makes up that number, though. Oh, I under no, I understand that. I I, I understand that we chose the the six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we. we oh, you're it. talking about the surplus plan, is what yeah. you're segregating. Yeah. At. Okay, that wasn't clear. I understand. Okay, okay. but here, to your point, though, I want to get back to the original question: Do we lose control? Right. Mm -hmm. The way I look at this is the the actions of saying we're going to gather up all these savings and we're going to use it to pay down debt right we're going to allocate it to debt we lose no control over doing that there's nothing that we've done there that loses control that's totally separate from your question over can we guarantee that that money gets spent you know to to your point mm -hmm. the, the truck or whatever mm -hmm. and the honest answer to that is no we cannot from this board, because if you decide, regardless of what's going on, right, you could decide even if the state fully funds, even if the governor's plan, we don't get anything, we don't get cut again. And I'm, I'm not saying you're going to do this, but you could decide not to buy that truck or not to buy this or not to buy whatever you want to do, Promise. because you can spend up to what's appropriated or you can spend less. And that's exactly what we did if we go back in history. Right. The board of Ed was looking at a million and a half shortfall. You know, part of the charge was put to together with them, mm -hmm. and that was in February, March. So at that point, we're sitting down saying, what can we hold off on? You, you, there are certain expenses at that point, it's too late in the year to make any significant cuts in. The only thing you can do is go back and say, what capital purchases can we not make? Not because we want to, just that's the only way you can save that much money in the 90 days left in the year. In the same way that, that when uh, things come through at this point, uh, it's hard to make what I'll call strategic adjustments when you're trying to make the adjustments in the next three weeks. Yes. Now we can change that after, but mm -hmm. in the next three weeks we have to plan. I'm looking at this, we need a plan going forward on July 1st that says we can save whatever money we need to. Mm -hmm. Now during the next year, we might change that. Things might change between then and September, things might change throughout the year. But between now and July 1st, we need a plan that says we can start the year and no, we'll finish in the black. Yes. And that's kind of what I was getting at about talking to Mr. Dwyer and getting them fully on board and meeting and having meetings because when they control two-thirds of the budget, it gives you a lot less flexibility on the third that you control. And, and which is really not even a third when you get down to it because when you take out contractual salaries and debt benefits, service. Debt, service. It, it, debt service, it starts shrinking that to very much so. Whereas um, the um, board of ed has to be involved because of, they have a lot greater flexibility on. I mean, I understand that their salaries and, and, and benefits are a great portion of their budget as well, but um, it just seems that everyone's got to be at the same page. Any other questions? Mr. Beckham, or comments uh, rather. <laughs> well, no, I, at this point, I mean, we've kind of gone past, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, a comment I had partway through, we don't really have control, quote unquote, that's sort of been recognized. I mean, in theory, yes, you administrate it. I would hope that, that we, you know, work and have enough trust between the board and the administration to, to kind of put a direction. I think, I think Mr. Walsh did generally hit on a point I was trying to make earlier, which is there were some items like that, and we're saying if we're going to transfer this, we want to be able to buy that truck. We get it that if the cuts total up and there's another million, okay, you know, all bets are off. But if it's 2.3 and we are trending towards that 2.3, put some stuff in maybe in July, but when we get to September, we do all those transfers and, and everything that's out, go ahead and sort of say, you know, loosen up and make those things happen because that's why we're trying to do all these things. Otherwise, we just put it back in the, in, you know, in, in, in the fund like we normally do at the end and increase our fund balance and, you know, move on with that goal, which was up until all this talk was going to cruise, you know, well into the nines and get almost where we want to be. So we're going to, you know, by not doing that, I think we're hopeful that that's not going to happen, but there's a goal that we want that's going to take place. But it does rest ultimately on you to administer that goal. Yeah, that, that A is the role of the administration. But second, I mean, we spent a lot of time putting that budget together. We spent a lot of time making sure that we weren't overspending in that budget. Uh, so simply put, I'd like nothing better than to spend that budget. 
So on the round table of comments, me too. Agreed. Any others? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor, please keep us surprised as we go forward and as the estimates change. The numbers will move around a little bit, but it sounds like as it relates to the initial cut, we're in pretty good shape. I will have new numbers at the next meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tetra. All right, item number six, to establish a Board of Finance Building Committee Review Committee. I'm going to uh, uh, put this item before us. I'm going to ask Mr. Walsh to speak to it since he was one of the movers and shakers on this. Mr. Brown, can you take Well, it? I think we had started speaking about it uh, at the last meeting, and I uh, was making a motion to set up this committee. Uh, the system seems to be completely broken, this building committee situation. And the amount of money with the last several projects we've been over. Um, and we can't be over by 35% or more on projects and not know about it. Um, or get very limited information. Or people make decisions when they know that they can save money, but want aesthetically pleasing things to themselves, even though they know they're going to blow the budget. Uh, and this committee's got, I think this, this board has got to be more versed. And I don't know whether it's, I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know if a liaison from this board onto a building committee is really going to have, really do anything. And we've had problems with that before, as you pointed out, Mr. Flynn. Um, but I think that this board based on the amount of money that we've been going over and things, is it's just time that we start going through and coming up with some recommendations to uh, the selectmen, I guess, when they put together the charge, on what we're expecting to see. In terms of reporting. In, port, in charge of yeah. reporting, in charges, and, and, and in regards to what they can do, what they can't do. I think Mr. Tetro made a, a good suggestion about maybe the town hires the architect Mm -hmm. and uh, the construction manager so that maybe that there's not influences by people who are in the construction industry who deal with certain architects and certain construction managers on a regular basis and take some of that potential conflict or at least perceived or uh, conflict out of that situation. Um, but I think we're going down a, from talking to, from just having gone through the Holland Hill situation and the way we're going in that direction. I did talk to Dr. Title a little bit about this. We might be going down a better route on how we're going to do this in the future, but I think it's time to put together a committee to review it, to see how we would prevent um, what happened up at Fairfield Ludlow High School with the most recent project and these windows not being completed and not having the money to do it and being four million dollars over budget. It's just it's just high time to go through that process. So um, I want to opine on your your thoughts there. I think that um, number one, I know the first selectman is working with several members of his administration as well as members of um, shall we say building committees that have had better experiences to come up with their thought processes between the building committees and the and the Board of Selectmen, which at the end of the day, um, the building committees report to the Board of Selectmen. I think that um, I fully support putting together a committee, subcommittee of our group, that says what are our ex expectations when a building committee are formed in terms of reporting requirements, mm -hmm. um, which could include a liaison to the building committees, or it could include quarterly updates from the building committee, could include better tracking or better financial information. And, and I'm not trying to say that financial information is bad. Um, but um, basically, uh, a year to date or a project to date reporting as to where that project is at any given quarter of the year, any and all those should be under consideration for this committee to say, you know, this is what the Board of Finance should be receiving in terms of reporting from a building committee. Mr. Tetra. If I might. Um and Jim, I think you and I worked on the RTM on a committee that talked mostly about school reimbursements, but yeah, I think it yeah. had some recommendations in that. It did. In terms and of reporting coming Those back. recommendations, that whole report, that worked out. People fought that at the time, as you know. There's people who didn't really well, want to have that committee either, but I yeah. think in the end, it was a positive thing for the town. I think if, and if we had a bipartisan yeah. basis, I think we came up with a system that has worked if, well since then. If I remember, 
the recommendations in that report were pretty much unanimously received mm -hmm. and unanimously approved. Yeah. Even, um, however, it might be good to go back and look at some of those recommendations and see if we are still following those as completely mm -hmm. as we perhaps started out to. Because sure. I know it had some recommendations about reports to the Board of Finance mm -hmm. and I, on and a I, quarterly basis. Yeah, and I also served on a committee about 10 years ago as well after the Tomlinson situation. Certainly not as good as the one we served on. <laughs> so more efficient, much better. <laughs> better members. Um, shorter meetings. Um, Not earlier, and I, I think promise you. I think we should go and, and look at all those reports, right? All those recommendations. And I, I, what, I, what I want to be cognizant of is not duplication of effort here. And I think we ought to share whatever we want, you know, with the RTM so that they can come up with whatever their reporting requirements are. Yeah. But I, I, I think the answer here is really focused on how things are going to be reported out and when they're going to be reported out. Um, well, I think that's one component. I think what we're looking at from the Board of Selectmen yeah, is, 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 you know, to stay away from what I'll call dueling architects, which yeah. seem to be one of the issues coming up here, uh, and also to take some of the pressure off our volunteer boards in terms of trying to hire certain professionals right from the start when they may not have the most experience in doing that, may not have the most background. I think we become much stronger, bitter in the process if we're bidding in terms of a number of town projects rather than just one. So that in essence, if you don't perform the way we want, uh, you're not working for the town again in the foreseeable future. And I do have to say one of the most, um, and I just want to bring this up because I don't know whether this was clear last meeting, one of the most disconcerting aspects of what happened with the Fairfield Ludlow project to me was a lot of the decisions that were made as to what needed to be done and how quickly it needed to be done was under this whole concept of, oh my God, the children are coming. The students are going to be here. The growth is going to be very high. And we need to accommodate all those students as quickly as possible. We need to have this done by September 1st. So we need to prioritize these items to get them done immediately without coming back before the boards because quite frankly, there's no time to do so. And then you actually look at what happened. It was the same numbers that were already in the school. Right? It was, it was 1,300 kids were there, which were being accommodated. Now there was problems with the program. I get it. Right? But they were delivering the program. And guess what? We're done with it now. And several years later, there's 1,300 kids still in that school. So you know, the building committee was operating under the assumption. We were operating under the assumption that there was a bubble of kids that were going to come through and there was no place to see them, right? And also that it was three projects combined into one. I get that. that. You know, and, and, but I think that complicates things. I think that's a lesson. There are a number of takeaways from the Ludlow project. I think that's one of right. the ones that made it difficult to manage on, at every level. But truthfully, if everybody had known that there were 1,300 kids that were being accommodated, again, not optimally, but they were being accommodated, they were delivering program, they were graduating from school, and there were still going to be 1,300 kids coming through the same infrastructure, right? Maybe the more prudent course would have been have it come back before the boards and say, we underestimated this thing, we got to rethink it, we got to look at the architect, we got to do this. The driving motivation was, at least from everything I was told, the kids are coming, the kids are coming. That, we have that, place to that created the September 1st deadline. Mm -hmm. I think that um, Right. The, the idea of, of having a better conceptual estimate uh, has been one of the uh, lessons learned, I'd say, and that, that we really need to get to the detailed drawings get as because when we get to that point, uh, we've actually come in closer to those those estimates. Yeah. It's the early concept numbers that we've really blown away. And specifically in the Ludlow case, we blew away three different types of projects in that sense on, on those early concept numbers. Yeah. I also think there's got to be somewhat more of a priority on the building committees when they look at projects to focus on how much money they have and not going over that. Because in hearing during the various nights we heard this over the last month and a half, the rushing to get it done right. by, by, they were being dictated to by that principal by the by the by Dr. Title and the Board of Education that these kids are all coming and da da da, da. and they started spending money on overtime, lots of overtime, working weekends, 
stuff that was never in any budgets that we ever saw. And to be quite honest with you, the tail should not be wagging the dog. In the end, it's our, it's our building. It's the town building, and it's the town's money. And there just seemed to be an overemphasis on that and an overemphasis on design and what they wanted as opposed to, okay, we knew it, we were going to go over budget, but we still wanted that bifurcated cafeteria. We knew we could have saved money there, but we still spent it. We were re-engineering to save money, but we knew you could re-engineer it to save money there, but we decided to go that way anyway. There's got to be more of an emphasis on what dollars do I have and not going over. It's just like any household. The primary in most building projects for families, it's how much money do we have? There's a lot of extras we'd all love to have. Some people would like to have a bathroom. Yes, we'd like to have heated floors. If you don't have the money, you know, we'd, I think there's an overemphasis on people just trying to get what they want and putting their signature on it and things like that. And there's got to be more of an emphasis somehow during the charge of the money being paramount. And if you can't get it done, we understand that. Come back. You got to come back and just let everybody know and say, we got to rethink this. You would ask for more money. And I think what was going on is people were afraid that if they went back to either our body or the Board of Selectmen or, or the RTM, that the extra money wouldn't be approved. So let's just spend it. And that's, that was my take on going through, through everything. Yeah, I think there are a number of different things that impacted that, but what might be you know, stepping back and trying to, to address your concern or comments in that regard, as opposed to thinking about a Board of Finance liaison for the entire project, which certainly is a big task to undertake, mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest to you that once we go out to bid and get a number back, we are very seldom over. Mm -hmm. Right, so appropriate it after we get the bids are pretty darn close. Well, in, lower down the funnel. In the school, in the school project, we can't because we've got to have a number to go for school reimbursement. Understand. There's a difference within that. But what I was going to suggest it, to uh, uh, Mr. Walsh's point, if what you're trying to do is have quicker feedback, maybe having a board of li finance liaison during that initial period. Well, because once you go out to bid and once that stuff that's set, that's going. There's not much we're going to change after that with, without a complete stop of the project, a complete redesign, which is all going to be very expensive. But well, a lot of the decisions that you're questioning or had concerns about were those that were made early on. Well, let's not define what we want the committee to come back with. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. What for, I your, wanna, for your consideration. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> what I want to do is get the, the subcommittee established. Mm -hmm. So can you make the motion to establish the subcommittee with a specific charge, if you have it? We can discuss it, get the subcommittee established. I don't have a charge for it. I just say that, you know, I, I, I mean, I could say what I want the committee to try to accomplish during their... Okay. What I'd like to do is, let's take five minutes um, and write up a specific, you know, what we want them to report back to us, how we want them to function. Let's, assuming it gets approved, approve the committee, and then subsequent to the meeting, I'll ask for volunteers to serve on the committee, and I'll appoint the committee. Um, and we'll go from there. So do we want to take just a couple of minutes? Mr. Walsh, can I uh, sure. impose upon you since it's your idea? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. May yes. I, um, before we take five minutes. Sure. Um, we're going to work on a charge, and I think it's important to have a good charge. Sure. All right? I want the committee to be focused and to be moving in the right direction. Um, but I also note that we have three members who are not here tonight sure. who may or may, or may not want to be on it and be involved. Um, I don't know if we should be picking people until we have people oh, here. No, what I said was I wasn't going to pick people. Said okay. Was not going to I not said I was people. not going to pick people tonight. Okay. All right. Exactly. Well, if we're not going to pick people, then my suggestion might, maybe you might want to take more than five minutes to think about the charge. Well, let's see what he comes up with. We'll, take, right. a, we'll, we'll take a recess for five minutes. We'll see what he comes up with. We'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back in five. All right. Good evening, everyone. We're going to come back to the table. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Walsh for his efforts on putting together the charge for this. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim, to read your proposed charge. I move to establish a committee of the Board of Finance to be called the Board of Finance Building Committee Review Committee that will be charged with reviewing the cost overruns of the Fairfield Ludlow Building Project and the Riverfield Building Committee Project 
and making recommendations to the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance to prevent cost overruns in, the, in future building committee projects. Said committee will also make recommendations on how the Board of Finance will receive reports from the building committees to provide the board with financial progress reports. Okay, do we have a second to that? Mr. Brown, we have a second before us. The item is before us for discussion. Anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns on that? Mr. Walsh, you, you wanted to do two functions. You wanted to, to serve to review a couple of different building projects and see why the cost overruns happened. Well, I think the last two were over. And it had, you know, and some of it had to do with, you know, I guess there's probably different reasons for each one, but it was Riverfield and, and Lebel. What would you like them to come back with? What is their work product as it regards to the two uh, looking? With recommendations after reviewing those two projects and the way they happened um, on how to prevent that from happening again so that we don't, we're not ending up with $4 million cost overruns, which is, I think, over 35% cost Absolutely. overrun. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, it's an unbelievable amount. Okay. And it's an amount that this town has never seen before. By, by on a percentage by, basis. By, on a percentage basis, by, by, by leaps and bounds. Right. And same thing happened with Riverfield. We thought we were spending a certain amount. We ended up spending a significant amount more than that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, we can't, we can't be voting on numbers and thinking that's what it is and putting them in a, in a, in a, in a waterfall. So and, and, and thinking that these are numbers are accurate numbers and then all of a sudden having to be told, oh, we need another $4 million. And I know the Board of Ed has no problem with it. They're all like, oh, we just tweak our waterfall here, there, and everywhere, and it's not that big a deal. But to me, putting another $4 million on the town credit card is, is, is a big deal. Okay. So it's to retroactively look at those two building committees, look at what happened with those two projects, make recommendations based on the lessons learned there. Those recommendations would really go to the Board of Selectmen who actually um, the building committees report to, correct? Yes, I also want them to be made to us so that if other, people, other members here have, can, we can tweak that and can agree with those recommendations so that we could present some... You to know, the board of select. Yeah, yeah, because... Okay, and then there's actual going forward as an out output of that as well is what report formats or what the reporting relationship should be between the building committee and the board of finance. Yes, whether they're reports that are quarterly, whether it's a liaison who's reporting to us on a monthly basis, uh, you know, some other methodology. Maybe it's Mr. Mayor coming to us every month and telling us where they stand and where they're going and what changes were made. I, I don't know what that is, but whatever the committee wants to do. I'm sure he's not going to want that responsibility. So, Mr. Mayor. If I may, I, actually, uh, as, as everybody here knows, we hired a new purging director who's uh, much more fluent with munis and numbers and other things than our prior purchase director. Um, so, uh, you know, this is not, you know, some significant reporting effort is, is not beyond the pale here. The, the only other comment I'd make is, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, but I think there's some lack of clarity on functional responsibility with respect to, does the owner's rep report to the committee, report to the first selectman, report to the town? So when you talk about reviewing uh, and making recommendations, I'd, I'd put a clause in there, including such things as authority, functionality, responsibility, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit, rather than just, it's because it's, it's more than reporting. It's, it's, it's an excellent idea. Yeah, I, I had a couple minutes to draft it. I, uh, but I mean, we can make a list here. We can start adding on to it right now. Um, or the committee could do it. But I, I, I agree. All those things need to be covered. I mean, I, I would like a, I'd like a thorough review of the whole process. Um, Mr. Mayor, although this is going to be a committee of the Board of Finance, I think having you and/or the purchasing director uh, involved heavily with this committee um, would be very beneficial. Would you make sure that that happens? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Is any are there any other comments from board members on this, Mr. Hopkins? Yeah. Um, Mr. Walsh just said he wants to see a thorough review of the whole process. I 
I think that should be the charge right there. <laughs> I, I, I think that should be the whole process, uh, the whole committee's job. Um, this, what should the outcome be? I don't want to be? see too much focus on what happened wrong with the recent building committees. I, I think we've really, really reviewed those and, and got a lot of information. We've heard extensive testimony. I think we've got a pretty good idea of what, what happened there. Um, I think what we really want to focus on is issues like how can we make sure that we can get better bids to begin with? How can we make sure that the initials, the initial plans are really what they needed? I, this particular building committee seems to have gone off the rails because they changed what was actually going to be built and the original plans weren't fitting what they were deciding they wanted to do. So apparently their original plans weren't really very adequate. Um, I think so th those initial processes really, really need to be looked at and, and are really probably the better part of the focus. Um, as far as reporting back, I agree with Mr. Mr. Mayor, we need to have something more um, in the form of how do we report back and make sure there's more input from town bodies and town elected officials before uh, money is spent, before significant actions are taken that are going to commit town funds in bondings. I mean, before they made um, uh, their commitment to do these things, then, you know, probably the Board of Finance should have been uh, consulted, and even the RTM, as a matter of fact. The other night we talked about um, possibly an ordinance that would require um, any building committee to come back and any time that their um, plans were going to be a certain per increased to a certain percentage of the total original commitment. Um, you know, something like that would probably be appropriate, or that could be in the original um, building committee's charge that they have to do that. Any of those functions would, would be appropriate, but I think we need to consider those things also. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Mr. Brown. I agree that taking a look at this whole process is, is the main point of the first charge that Jim had uh, reviewed and reporting his second. But I do think it's a good idea to review the previous building committees, Ludlow and Riverfield, because that's how we're going to learn see what they did, and then make the appropriate recommendations on what we may do differently next time. So it's, it's, part, of, it's part of reviewing the whole process. It's look at specific examples, what we can learn from those specific examples, and then say, okay, what, what do we want to do differently? What could we do differently? We also have to take a look at, I, I think, uh, at the bonding resolutions as well, how they are presented to us, and if there's any changes we might need to make, in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, that, which is just part of the process. Yeah, right. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing, and it's the way we, we go about getting there. And I think that having specific examples, not trying to play the boogeyman, not trying to point fingers, but lessons learned, would appear to me to be appropriate backup for what the recommendations are going to be going forward. I think we'd be wrong if we didn't document what went wrong. It was like when we did the SFU, the, the State Reimbursement Program. We didn't say well, we we're, 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 we're not going to say we're not going to say what just went wrong. Right. We're going to actually document it, put it in a document, and present it as ev uh, not evidence, but present it as a uh, a working document so that when we draft the charges, or not we, but the board of selectmen drafts these charges, these recommendations would hopefully find their way into that. Okay. So I think we have a a decent working charge going forward. I think it can be refined a little bit. The committee can refine it a little bit. I want to ask about um, deadline here. What do, we, do we want to put a deadline? Or do we want the committee to come back to us after our first couple of meetings and tell us what they think a reasonable deadline might be for them to be able to report back to us? Which seems to me this is pretty broad, so it seems to me that would be the way to go, but I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with that. Maybe after the first couple of meetings, they need to assess how much work they're actually going to do. That's many, what I think. How many, how much testimony, how many different people they need to hear from. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? I agree. After a couple of meetings, let's get an idea. Okay. So I'm going to ask, this item is before us as read. I think it encompasses, and I think at least the discussion we get a flavor of, of what we want to accomplish. Mr. Hopkins, to your point. Mr. Mayor, to yours. Uh, so I think I'm ready to call a vote on this. And then what I'll ask is, um, assuming this is approved, I'd ask for volunteers, including of their three missing members this evening, who would be willing to serve on the committee. Uh, we'll establish the committee, and we'll ask them to report back to us after a couple of meetings 
as to what the um, deadline is going to be. And we'll also ask for an update at our quarterly meeting. Anybody have issues with that? Seeing none, I'm going to call this for a vote. All in favor to establish the Board of Finance Building Committee Review Committee under the charge that Mr. Walsh has written up that will have drafted into the minutes. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? That committee is formed. Thank you very much. I'll be asking for volunteers if people could email me as well as um, I have already spoken to a couple of the members that are missing tonight and I'll make sure that gets out to them. Mr. Mayor, can we make sure we send out an email to them tomorrow asking for volunteers for the committee? Um, and then we'll go on to item number seven, uh, which is to discuss the fund balance committee and the budget committee. Um, this was uh, my item to put back on here. Um, I wanted to make sure that after the budget process, we didn't lose sight of the fund balance committee. And Mr. Walsh, as prior chair of that, I'd ask you to fire that committee back up, as we've discussed previously, um, to discuss where the fund balance now stands and what kind of uh, updates we want to make, A, to the policy, if at all, or be to our process going forward. Would you be so kind as to get that committee back together? Sure. I don't think it's going to take that, that I don't think it's that longer lengthy. because we had fully ex you know, reviewed policies from other communities and other states and right. whatever. Um, I, I would like to speak to, like, you know, uh, Matt Sperndell and some of the other people just to see what, and, and Joe Santafani to see whether any of the metrics have changed or you know, our metrics are where they should be. Great. And we also will need another volunteer for that committee because I believe we've had some turnover. So uh, we'll have to get that out there as well. Um, we need at least one new member. I know Mr. Walsh was on that. Mrs. LeClaire was on it. And I think last time Mrs. Alvin was on it as well, correct? Yep. So we'll need at least one new member of that committee. Um, not opposed to having more uh, if anyone so chooses. So if we could do that. Any questions, comments, concerns on that? Thank you, Mr. Walsh. If you could report back sure. to us at our quarterly meeting on that, oh. which would be in September. So who are the new members going to be? We don't know yet. Okay. Well, it'll be okay. yourself, Mrs. LeClaire, okay. will continue. And okay. I think we need at least one new member. Yes. Okay. And if there's others that want to be on there, sure, feel free. Okay. Okay? That sounds great. Um, Mr. Hopkins, for your, we always try to have members of both parties. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Um, then the other committee is the budget committee. We have the chair of the budget committee here. Mr. Brown, do you have anything to report or what are steps on that committee? Well, Mr. Stone was part of this committee along with uh, Mr. DeWitt and myself. So Chris and I have discussed, we've traded some ideas. Matter of fact, we sent a real preliminary draft over to Mr. Flynn. We still have some work to do there. We want to talk to the first selectman as well and include him in this process too. So we've we started this. Um, if we could have, and when's our next meeting? Um, I believe we're off in July and we have August. Is that correct, Mr. Mayor? I believe we are off in July. I'm not aware of that. I, we are off in July, so I guess at the beginning of August. So either yeah. beginning of August or we can make that a goal or the quarterly review, whichever. Why don't we go for the beginning of August? Because usually it's, a, number one, it's closer to when the budget process was. Number two, it's usually a quiet time of year. We so should be able to do that. Okay. okay. We'll have we'll have a we'll have a report firmed up for the meeting. Oh, we'll need another volunteer for that committee as well. For the August meeting, August monthly meeting. Any other questions, comments, concerns on the committees? We've got a lot of work on these subcommittees coming up. Um, Mr. Chair, volunteering. Could you yes. do me a favor and list for me the current members on each of those three committees? Oh, geez, you're going to test test me. Okay, budget committees, Mr. Brown and Mr. Dewitt. We need a third. Fund balance committee is. One second, I don't write that fast. Okay. Fund balance committee, it's Mr. Walsh and Mrs. Leclaire. We need a third, at least. Um, and then we do not have the members of the Board of Finance Building Committee Review Committee yet. We need to ask for volunteers for that committee. Uh, sure. And we did have a uh, reporting committee too, which was long time ago. Yeah, we haven't done anything. Whether, whether, I don't know whether that's it's yeah. gone or not, but we're missing a member if we're still. <laughs> Let, let's worry about these three right now. I, actually, the reporting thing is seeming to go okay at our quarterly meetings. 
Does anybody else have any other business or uh, communications to discuss? The only thing I, I do want to reiterate is I have been having ongoing discussions with Mr. Tetra, Mr. Mayor, as well as reached out to members of our um, state delegation trying to get some clarity over what um, the governor's recent line item veto actions uh, may have on, on the town. And as Mr. Tetro um, alluded to earlier, um, there's no new information available other than what we read in the press. Obviously, if I hear of anything, I will forward it to this board as quickly as I get it. Um, but that's all I know right now. Anybody have anything? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Hopkins, do I have a second? Mr. Becker, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.